diverse, like, I think there's like 40 songs that they, you know, they're all teeny tiny. Yeah, and then he's like, so I'm like, so next steps are I find a publisher. Yeah, I guess. So, yeah, so did I. Jingle, 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 jingle all the way, jingle all the way, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh! Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Dashing through the snow in a one-horse open sleigh. O'er the fields we go, laughing all the way. Bells on top tail making spirits cry. What fun it is to ride and see the sleighs on tonight. Oh, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Now the ground is wide, got it while you're young. Take the girls tonight and sing the sleigh song. Just get a pop to me. To 44 to speed, then hitch into an open sleigh and crack. You'll take the leap. Come with us and hear those jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open Jingling, 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 jingling. Open sleigh, hey! Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church at Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to serve the, as the minister with this congregation of people of all ages at all stages of life. This is a beloved community striving to live into its mission of embracing freedom, loving wholeheartedly, adding to the wholeness and the healing of the world, growing in mind, body, and spirit. We welcome people of all ethnicities and races, sexual orientations, gender identities, politics, social and economic situations, and abilities. We advocate for human rights, and we strive to be good stewards of this earth. And in living our mission, we recognize the network of relationships of which we are a part. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They and other nations were here long before the first European settlers came down the Illinois River. And so we take a moment every time we gather in worship on Sunday to honor the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank everybody for joining us in person and online. We recognize how important it is to gather together, how precious it is to be with one another and to expand our circles of care and kindness. So if you are new, Please help us get to know you. We have an abundance of name tags, and lots of people can answer any questions. Um, and also, please gather after the service in Fellowship Hall if you're with us in person for a chance to have coffee and conversation, or in the Zoom room if you're with us online. I also want to invite you to turn your respective devices to worship for that. This is the Android version.
you know, we are bilingual, Android and Apple. We can do this, right? There we go. Apple version. All right, thank you. Clearly, we have a, a video ministry, so, you know, by all means, ask for help if you need it to. Uh, I have a couple of notes for today. One is that after service today in the conference room uh, is a coffee with the minister. This is an opportunity to ask me questions about life, the universe, and the congregation. So get a drink or a snack in Fellowship Hall and join us there after service. Uh, I have a little bit of a special announcement. We have a bonus guest today during service, which is Mrs. Claus. We welcome Mrs. Claus. Yay. Thank you. You know, Santa, he's a little busy, right? That's okay. Uh, Mrs. Claus will be with us for the morning, and we'll be joining the children and youth back uh, when they leave for their time. And speaking of that, we also have in Fellowship Hall today, uh, the 10,000 Villages is here with lots of wonderful things to sell, a lot of fair trade items. Uh, they work with local craftspeople around the world to bring beautiful goods to a place like Peoria. So I highly recommend the fair trade chocolate for yourself and holiday shopping for everybody else. The children will have a chance to do a little bit of shopping during the RE time and do a little wrapping if, if they find some gifts. So if they, if you didn't, or if they don't already have a little bit of money with them, you might want to send them with a little bit of something too. And uh, we have some wonderful things coming up uh, next weekend in particular. One on Saturday at 6 p.m. is the winter solstice ritual uh, created and hosted by our uh, pagan group, the Keepers of the Great Grove. I highly recommend joining for that. It'll be here in Fellowship Hall. Also, next Sunday, I'm going to clarify a point of information for next Sunday. It's December 24th, so Christmas Eve falls on a Sunday, and that means not one, but two services. Two services. One we will have, thank you, Patrick, one we will have at 10.30 in the morning, which is an interactive uh, pageant. Um, it's a family-friendly and it's participatory, so I want to in, in welcome people to join us for that uh, at our usual 10.30 worship time. And see Jesse Laughlin if you'd like a part uh, in making that happen. Also on December 24th at 7 p.m., is our traditional uh, Lessons in Candles candlelight service. The evening will feature a choir, wonderful many other musicians, and ancient and modern scripture. And I think cookies are welcome to bring for our hospitality after the service. If you're inclined to, if you have a few extra, or if somehow you like, I can't do another cookie, but I'll bring it to church, this is the moment. There we go. I also want to invite you to look at the order of service for all of this week's activities and our holiday events. We have a lot going on. Good stuff. Now, let us enter into worship. Please rise and body your spirit for our opening hymn number 40, The Morning Hangs a Signal. It is in the gray hymnal if you'd like to have the music in front of you too.
I'd like to invite Holly Green forward for our opening words. In the Spirit of Searching by Reverend Joan Javier Duval. Out of depths unknown, the spark of life ignites, and we are born. We enter a world, a universe not of our making. Our lives unfold in mystery and wonder. Questions abound for which there is no definite answer. And so we gather in community to seek in one another assurance and recognition, compassion and strength. We gather in community to be reminded of what is most ultimate, of what is most sacred. In this spirit of searching and of reverence, let us worship together this morning. And I invite the Moberg family forward for our chalice lighting. Alive in all creation. Spark of spirit, caught in earth's embrace, light of love, alive in all creation. As we kindle this flame, we rekindle our connection to the sacred web of life. Oh, no. 
Reverend Sue Sahusky reminds us that day by day, month by month, year by year, we are all confronted with what we do not know, what we do not understand, what we do not grasp. Sometimes we are humbled by this knowledge, and sometimes we are saddened. Sometimes we are angered by this knowledge. Sometimes we are curious and say, holy and inexplicable is this life. I have no idea what happened or how it happened or somehow, some way, something changed. And I'm free to explore new ways of being. Please let me always continue to search for the unknown in myself and others. Let us enter into a time of meditation with the spirit of unknowing. During the music for meditation, you're welcome to come forward and light candles, making a tangible act that marks what is in your mind and on your heart. For those of us joining online, please light candles with us or simply receive the gift of light, light from those that are here. Let us begin.
from A. Powell Davies. What are we, any of us, but strangers and sojourners forlornly wandering through the nighttime until we draw together and find the meaning of our lives in each other, dissolving our fears in each other's courage, marking and making music together and lighting torches to guide us through the dark. This is the time when we extend our circle of care and share the joys and sorrows of the congregation. We send healing wishes to Judith Corrin Shanahan. Judith bruised her arm in a fall last weekend. May she heal quickly and well. We offer support and wishes for health to Mary Mahalan Kafar's wife, Marsha. Last week, Marsha had been struggling with illness and low spirits, and I hear from Mary that Marsha is doing a bit better now, and Mary is grateful for our love. We extend our sympathy to Kathy McNeil and her family for the death of Kathy's father. Jean McNeil died early this morning. He was known as Pa to many. It is a hard loss for her and her family. We offer our care and compassion to them. We offer another note of sympathy to Dave Brebner and his family. Dave's stepmom, Naomi, died yesterday at the age of 90. We offer our care and compassion to Naomi's family, all who knew her. Let us hold one more moment of quiet together for all the joys, the sorrows, the names and the milestones that are with us and remain unspoken. In this moment, we can remember and reconnect with the circle of care that holds all. I invite you to breathe with me and pause. Amen, shalom, and blessed be. And now I invite Jesse forward for our story for the morning. It's not what you believe, but how. This story by Reverend Gary Kowalski. Babies don't believe anything. Babies aren't born Buddhist or Baptist or really believers of any sort. But soon after we arrive in this world, we start to gather ideas. We pick up beliefs about people and animals and families we collect ideas about stars and comets and how all of this got started. We accumulate beliefs about good and bad, right and wrong, what's healthy and unhealthy, and what's important. All of these beliefs, some come from our parents, some from our friends, some from TV, some from church, they all go into our belief bag. Hmm. Now, most religions define themselves by what's inside their belief bag. Christians, for instance, might tuck in here a belief in Jesus. Perhaps Muslims believe in Allah and the Prophet Muhammad, and something special in us. 
But Unitarian Universalists, hmm, what do we believe? Hmm. We're a little different in that we carry our belief bag with us in a certain way. There's different ways to hold your bag, you know. Some people hold their bag like this, really tight at the top. Nope, what's in here is gonna stay in here. Nothing else can get in. But some people, hmm, they just leave their bag open. Maybe they drag it around. Some things just land in there. Maybe they saw something on TV. Maybe they saw an article on the internet. And they said, well, it's printed. I'll just shove that in my belief bag. Hmm. Hmm. But some people, they carry their bag in a scary way. Maybe they use their bag as a club. Hmm. What's in their bag may sound really nice and sweet, but they use it like a weapon. I believe in peace and kindness. Don't you? Why don't you believe in that? Hmm. And they try to shame people with their belief bag. But none of those is the way that we try to carry our belief bags. We carry them accessible, but safe. I can add things to my bag when it fits me. I can look in my bag and say, hmm, this used to fit me, but not anymore and put it down. But it's nice and cozy and nearby. And above all, we don't use our belief bag to bully other, to bully other people. Microphone. So that is what it means to be a Unitarian Universalist. The next time somebody asks you what all the people in your church believe, you can tell them that for Unitarian Universalists, having a single set of the same beliefs is not the most important thing. It's how we hold our beliefs, how we acquire them, how we share them, and most of all, what we do with those beliefs together. That's what matters. I wonder what beliefs you put in your bag. I wonder how you hold on to your bag. When the children come back with me, if the parents would like to make sure they have a list, they could come back for a moment and fill out a shopping list um, and a spending permission as well. The offering we take each Sunday. See, I, I'm really a fan of the Sundays in like the holiday season because you never know what the Sunday is going to bring. And this one brings Mrs. Claus in 10,000 villages. This is fabulous. The offering we take each Sunday isn't just a stale habit either. It's an opportunity to recommit to this place and to this people. Our offering is an affirmation is a yes. When we give, 
We say yes to something we value. And with our gifts freely given, may we say yes to the values of our faith. May our offering help us practice what we're acquiring and exchanging and learning and holding in our bags beyond the congregation, but to the larger world as well, to empower how we are out in all that is. We breathe life into this place through all the ways we gather and all the ways that we contribute. And I also want to say that one of the ways that we send a bit of our abundance out into the world is through our Share the Plate program. Each week, one-third of the undesignated offering goes to our monthly recipient. And uh, this month, our Share the Plate recipient is the Peoria chapter of the NAACP. We want to support them in their good work to support people's rights, to be advocates for those who have been historically marginalized, to be a public witness to those who have historically been struggling and oppressed in our society. So if you would, uh, one third goes to the NAACP, two thirds goes to the church. Please uh, use the offering envelopes to make a designation for how you'd like the use to go and see the QR code in the order of service to make an online donation, thank you. And now, uh, will the ushers please come forward? And I invite Jean Jost to join us for our reading today. Good morning. This reading is from Paul Stephen Dodenhoff. The freedom to doubt, to question, to be content to live in mystery is central to the liberal religious tradition. Like the process of evolution itself, the path we follow, our practice, if you will, is not simple or easy. It isn't without its dead ends or its disappointments. It doesn't guarantee that all our conclusions will be final, or that we will ever find an answer to all of our questions. But also like the process of evolution, 
It is filled with great expressions of beauty and awe that are sometimes born of great struggle and at other times come as unexpected grace. I wish you that unexpected grace and a happy Hall Halloween, uh, no, Christmas season. Please rise in body for our uh, hymn number 95, There is More Love. It is also in the gray hymnal. I begin with a traditional story retold by Doug Lipman. This comes to us from the Jewish traditions. So some students of Rabbi Baal Shemtov came to him one day with a question. Every year we travel here to learn from you. Nothing could make us stop doing that. But we have learned of a man in our own town who claims to be a, a Zadik, a learned and righteous one. If he is genuine, we would love to profit from his wisdom. But how will we know if he is fake? The Baal Shem Tov looked at his earnest students you must test him by asking him a question. And he paused. And he looked at his students again. You have had difficulty with stray thoughts during prayer. Is this so? Yes, said the students eagerly. We try to think only of our holy intentions as we pray, but other thoughts come into our minds 
We have tried many methods to not be troubled by them, but still the thoughts come. Good, said Baal Shem Tov. Ask this man who claims to be learned and righteous, ask him to weigh the way to stop such thoughts from entering your minds. The Baal Shem Tov smiled. If he has an answer, he is a fake. If he has an answer, he is a fake. I love this measure. I love this measure of whether someone is legitimate or just trying to sell you something. I mean, prayer and meditation, uh, contemplation, any and all of these forms of reflection are common across faith and humanity, spiritual practices. I mean, here we go. How many people have at least tried meditation, the kind where it tries to get you to focus your mind? Yes, yes. And eliminate distracting thoughts. Were you ever able to eliminate those distractions? No. I mean, if you say yes, by all means, what do you have to sell? I want to know. But I'm going to say no. The practice is the point, right? To follow a particular path to deepen, to explore, and to fully stop the mind chatter, yeah, that's not going to happen. One of my favorite moments of learning about the Dalai Lama was, was his confession, not really even a confession, but him just saying matter-of-factly, oh yeah, my mind goes in all kinds of places too. Even the Dalai Lama. In the story with the Baal Shem Tov, there are two impossible claims. One, the elimination of distraction. And two, the definitive answer. The rabbi Baal Shem Tov offers a simple approach that helps the students discern the merits of this teacher. The heart of religious and spiritual and a world, you know, just living in the world practice is this practice of inquiry, of asking questions, of not accepting the answer at the first encounter. The heart of practice isn't mere acceptance of faith and belief, not going with uh, where one answer is provided and immediately defined as definitive. The heart of practice is the practice and the inquiry. I deeply respect the Jewish tradition of questions and examination and argument with co-explorers with its deep history of doing so, of debating history, of debating interpretation, of debating scripture, debating and getting ticked off at Yahweh. At its best, spiritual and religious engagement teaches us how to wonder, how to inquire. And this is true, as I have found this in Buddhism, it's true in Islam, it's true in Catholicism, it's true in many branches of Christianity, in the pagan traditions, in indigenous paths. That moment of, wait a minute, I have a question, is universal. And it's that one question is this one of many in the course of exploration. To inquire is no surprise at the heart of a liberal religious tradition, pretty much by definition. The liberal approach is to hold our bag of beliefs with us and open and kind of flexible but not just everywhere, as we heard in the story. As Paul Dodenhoff says, the freedom to doubt, to question, to be content, to live in mystery is central to the liberal religious tradition, 
like the process of evolution itself, the path we follow, our practice, is not easy or simple. It's not without dead ends or disappointments, and there are no guarantees. And that's fully the experience as someone who grew up in this tradition. I presume that there are questions. It's the water in which we swim, if you will. We do the backstroke, and we do the, you know, we do all of that. On any given Sunday, there are and were more questions than people in the room, by maybe a few fold, frankly. The Bible was not taken literally, but more as part of the story of its time. It was more poetry, not a measure of faith. What led me to bigger questions, um, to bigger wondering, was when I encountered Unitarian Universalists who held uh, a range of beliefs. You know, it's a big tent, and so you have a lot of different places where people will encounter and explore, including Scripture and Jesus and God at the center for them. And they were also part of this tradition. I hold in high regard the Christian beliefs of many of my colleagues, and I benefit from the spiritual richness in prayer and song and worship when I get to gather with them. Many things can be true and wonderful all at once. But I also recognize the struggle and, in fact, the hardship for how so many of those of us gathered in this tradition and in the world lost, lost a lot when we started to doubt. Some of us even lost our families, our whole communities. I keep hearing stories of that loss. I've been hearing that all the entire time of being I'm talking with people about where, how did you come to find Unitarian Universalism? I think some of the most heartbreaking are the ones where people say, I truly cannot go back to my family. All for a bit of doubting. And the holidays at this point, I want to recognize how much that complicates the matter as well. Here we are, mere mortals, wrapped up in our questions, in genuine curiosity, wanting to know our place in the universe, and wanting to also have a sense of control, a sense of being connected, want to know what to trust and believe. It is remarkable how much religious communities and large branches of certain religions limit and control the experience of faith and wonder. I know every Unitarian Universalist congregation has a lot of um, ex-Catholics. Some, I've heard, say call themselves recovering Catholics for one group in particular former adherents in many, many ways. But also, but also how many people are still working within. It's not an either or. It's working within and trying to still have relationship with family, with community, and also with faith because of how much also it might have benefited from some of the beauty and the love that they also experienced in a respective tradition. we get to be further challenged by our current context of how difficult it is to simply know what's real in the world. This is true in our computers and technology with chat, GPT, and um, artificial intelligence. Like, who are we actually talking to when we're seeing something online? But also how hard it is to know what is fact and what is opinion and what is propaganda 
And there's a lot of propaganda. We are told not to believe certain sources and people when those sources are highly suspect. And yet, how do we still make sense of? How do we know what we can hold on to? It feels, I gotta say, for me, it feels like, like Dorothy in the tornado in The Wizard of Oz. Flashes of reality all over the place and still caught up in the swirl. Maintaining, simply maintaining a healthy practice of doubt is itself a struggle. Simply maintaining a healthy practice of doubt is itself a struggle. It feels like the authentic question is its own endangered species to a degree. I've always appreciated the wisdom from one of our 20th century Unitarian ancestors, the Reverend Robert Weston. His words, entitled, Cherish Your Doubts, were in the hymnal of the time. It happens to be this hymnal known. It's called Hymns for the Celebration of Life. We usually call it the blue hymnal. It's the blue one. We have the gray one. We also have the teal one and so on. And this is the one I had in divinity school and carried with me. And his words include, cherish your doubts, for doubt is the attendant of truth. Doubt is the key to the door of knowledge. It is the servant of discovery. A belief which may not be questioned binds us to error. For there is incompleteness and imperfection in every belief. Doubt is the touchstone of truth. It is an acid which eats away the false. Let no one fear the truth that doubt may consume it. For doubt is a testing of belief. The truth stands boldly and unafraid. It is not shaken by the testing. For truth, if it be truth, arises from each testing stronger and more secure. Cherish your doubts. For doubt is the attendant of truth. It is the servant of discovery. I think those few words are some of the most grounding for me. And Robert Weston doesn't mean truth as an absolute either. Let me be clear. It's not truth with a capital T. There is not one truth. The work is discovery. Doubt does not serve an idol that one could make of truth that relies on our obedience. The work is discovery. We must be free to pursue this effort. As Paul Dodenhoff points out, we will be aggravated by the dead ends, the disappointments, the lack of resolution. We are in for a lifetime of aggravation. Amen. And the practice is part of the work to simply preserve the freedom to doubt. The other point I want to return to with the opening story about the rabbi is what he's also asking the students to do, and just simply with the students, the relationship that is demonstrated there that it is about doing this work together. The heart of the practice is also doing this doubting with others, in community, with fellow students, with elders, with people of all ages. The individual journey and the shared journey has been part of the heart of the liberal approach for religion for all time, all time. Human impulse 
the human impulse cannot leave well enough alone. We got to keep wondering. We have to keep questioning and wanting to know why and how. One of the ones I've, I most appreciate from uh, our history is the Universalist Hosea Ballou, for example, in rural New Hampshire, Vermont, in the late 1700s, in the space of like two seasons, I think, he went from being a fully baptized on board member of his father's church to being excommunicated. He was very good at that. Because he kept looking at the Bible and reading it and saying, I don't see what you see. I see a whole other truth. And then he went on to proclaim one of the most expansive and inclusive theologies to thousands of people. In a time when you don't have radio and amplification, he was proclaiming that one doesn't even need to hear about Jesus to be in right relationship with God. 1805, this was a thing over 200 years ago, proclaiming. He was one voice in our long, long line of enthusiastic doubters. I am so grateful to be in the company in which we keep doing that work today. So all that said, I recognize, and I wanted, I brought the question of doubt into this month when we're in these holidays and kind of being asked to sing and think about peace and uh, goodwill and the larger picture. And we're about to celebrate Christmas with all of its wonder and all of its scripture as well. Because next Sunday evening, we will have lessons and carols and choir and music. And yes, there will be some from the Bible and some from modern thought. And we will have Jesus and God and the star and angels. It's Christmas. That's what's there. But also, neither the church nor I is asking you or anybody to subscribe to one understanding of this story and the elements thereof. We're not asking people to to say yes to a particular vision of God? No, that's not the point. We will tell the story of migrants, of wise people seeing a sign of life and hope, of hardship in the world, of new life undefeated. Like the reading from Paul Dodenhorf, I want to invite us invite you to join us for a chance to just simply be in mystery and wonder, to be immersed in this experience and be in the wondering mind, be in the doubting mind, be in the questioning mind. But sometimes it's simply about letting the experience be with us. And recognize the power of People saying the world can be different. Say, why does the world have to be this way with tyrants and empires and people put down? That was the question that got this started a long time ago. And we continue to ask that today, wondering about whether the child will, born, will be born, whether the child will live beyond the efforts of the empire to destroy them. These are the questions. We wrestle with our existence and place in the universe every time we sing of the star of Bethlehem, of angels, of shepherds, of the holy night. Each night a child is born, we proclaim, is a holy night. It's a time for singing, a time of wondering. The world is so much greater, so much larger than our mortal questions and still we wonder, and still we ask, and still we keep living. If anything, if anything, we get to embrace Christmas as an act of subversion, of flipping the script, 
that says wealth and power and armies will rule. Instead, we question that premise and instead proclaim that a single precious life has the capacity to disrupt those in power and call for justice and dignity for all. I think we should keep getting into it with those questions, yeah? We find what emer emerges as true for each of us, what emerges for our living together, for our human merely being in the vastness of our existence. So let us go forth in the spirit of that practice of inquiry and discovery, in the practice of freedom where we in fact do cherish our doubts and the greater life that comes from this journey. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit with me and join us for our closing hymn number 295, Sing Out Praises for the Journey. Carry the Flame by Reverend Brian Keeley. This chalice is now extinguished, but its light lives on in the minds and hearts and souls of each one of you. Carry that flame with you as you leave this place and share it with those you know, with those you love, and most importantly, with those you have yet to meet. May the service ended. May you go with love. Thank you. Go your ways, knowing not the answers to all things, yet seeking always the answer. Oh, be searchers with your fellow humans. Be adventurers in the ways untrod. And hold the hope of discovery high within you, sharing the hope and whatever discovery may come with the world. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin.